when you say dark ages, people generally know you're talking about that really murky period of history when which for historians is like a and actually a void of nothingness in terms of extant primary sources. There's so little primary sources that we have available to us, especially for the sixth century, that for early medieval historians, they call it the lost century of early medieval Britain and Ireland. So a better term, what people are more comfortable with these days, and I think is more accurate, is to say the early medieval period or perhaps even the late antique. There are more accurate ways to describe what was going on without discounting centuries of growth and culture and learning and ideologic change and political change. There was a lot going on in this period that formed the basis of modern Britain, Scotland, and Ireland. Hello and welcome to this week's pod. And for today's episode, I have a guest on to talk about a period of history about which I know pretty much nothing, the Dark Ages. Even the term, as you heard at the top there, causes historians to splutter in outrage. But Paula de Fougerol is a little bit more forgiving. We're going to learn about what happened in the wake of the Romans' departure, the influence of Christianity, St. Patrick, St. Augustine and St. Columba, and how Ireland colonised the rest of Britain. Paula de Fougerol is an award-winning author and historian of the period, and her Chronicles of Iona trace this period through two men, St. Columba, one of the Twelve Apostles of Ireland, and the warlord Conal MacCongale. I've put links in the show notes so you can find out more. Coming up, got plenty more history. I've been banging on about Tom Holland, but it's not a lie. It's recorded and will be out soon. I've also got an interview with Paul Lay on the Protectorate, the ten or so years after the death of Charles I. And on Tuesday, the film club is out with Gallipoli. Please do share and tell friends to help the pod grow. In the meantime, I'll hand you over to me talking the Dark Ages with Paula de Fougerol. Paula de Fougerol, welcome to the podcast. It's a great pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to chat with you today. Great, Paula. And we'll be talking about a period of history that for many listeners um, maybe aren't so familiar. I certainly am not so familiar. It's the Dark Ages. It's the first time we've really covered this period of history on the podcast. So this is going to be a very much a learning experience for me. I'm a bit unfamiliar. Uh, And it's in the context of of your set of novels, uh, which are called the Chronicles of Iona. Yep. And I, I think you re-released Exile, haven't you? Because because you originally yeah. wrote that a while ago. I, that was um, first published in 2013. And I came out with a second edition to mark the 10th anniversary of its publication and use the opportunity to switch things around a little bit, added some things um, from the back that had been stuck on as addenda, like his historical notes and pronunciation of the characters' names. I added that to the front just to help readers who were um, entering the world of sixth century Scotland, Ireland, and Britain for the first time. Fascinating. Now, this is very interesting to me because I've named this episode The Dark Ages mm-hmm. and with Paula de Fougerol. And mm-hmm. but it is quite a controversial name for the for the period of history i believe more recently many historians get very upset you you yourself you have a phd in this period so you 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 know you bow to no one in knowledge of the area so am i wrong to call it the dark ages and and I, why why is it a controversial why, why is that so um it's controversial because it it does a gross disservice to what was actually going on in that period of time between the fall of rome and between the consolidation of the anglo-saxons as the predominant political power in britain it was a lot more complex as history always is it's a misnomer it so historians obviously prefer to avoid that, but in modern parlance and com- sort of common understanding, when you say dark ages, people generally know you're talking about that really murky period of history when, which for historians is like a, and actually a void of nothingness in terms of extant primary sources. There's so little 
primary sources that we have available to us, especially for the sixth century, that for early medieval historians, they call it the lost century of early medieval Britain and Ireland. So a sort of a better term, what people are more comfortable with these days, and I think is more accurate, is to say the early medieval period, or perhaps even the late antique period, although that's usually referring to the fifth century. There, there are more accurate ways to describe what was going on without sort of um, discounting centuries of growth and culture and learning and ideological change and political change. There was a lot going on in this period that formed the basis of modern Britain, Scotland and Ireland. So my calling it the Dark Ages, I've simply contributed to this ongoing sort of rather lazy description of the period then. Yes, but um, it'll help people find the podcast because that is what people understand uh, to call it. So that's, you're forgiven. <laughs> great, great. Okay, so so let, let, let's get to grips with the history, really. I mean, I kind of get off the train once Rome falls. I, I'm now yeah. lost. And I do understand that before the fall of Rome, which was sort of late fifth century, before that, there was a retreat of the Romans in Britain, for example. So perhaps if you just help explain what's going on uh, as we enter this 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 era. Sure. So um, the traditional dates are the dates that people can sort of hang their hats on as scaffolding to understand what was going on when and where is that in um, the late fourth century, particularly the three eighties, all over all over the Roman Empire, but particularly in modern day Europe and in Britain and in Ireland, there were starting to be mass movements of people because the empire was beginning to collapse. This was the beginning of the end. And we know that Rome had to mount a series of very frantic defenses against particularly the Picts, who were the people who lived in Scotland at this time, and the Irish coming over from Ireland, who were constantly raiding Britain. But then that lasted for a little while, but then suddenly Rome itself came under attack, and the Rome had to, had to retract from the northernmost extent of its empire to protect, you know, its people back home. So they withdrew the last Roman legion from Britain in 406. And then in 410, 411, they made it official. They wrote a letter and said, boys, you are on your own. Good luck. So the other main movement of people, and this is very pertinent for the history of, of Britain and the UK today, is that the people who are moving into, especially the south and the east of Britain at this time were the Angles and Angles and Saxons and Jutes and Frisians. And they were Germanic people who spoke a er, very early form of English. And they were moving into the South and the rest of the country had to fend for itself. They had to organize themselves and fend for themselves. And so it's sort of to give a large overview of who was here at the time and what makes this period of history so fascinating, especially to me as a writer, is that you had four main groups of people who were living here at the time, speaking different languages with different customs, different laws, different social codes. And they were all butting up against each other, elbowing each other out for it to try to gain supremacy of the British Isles. And so this was over the course of the fifth century and into the sixth century. And, you know, really even up until one could argue until the Vikings came in the eighth century, everything was up for grabs. We had below Hadrian's wall and between Hadrian's wall and the Antonine wall. So for people who aren't familiar with that, the Antonine wall between Edinburgh and Glasgow and Hadrian's wall was between Newcastle and further south. So you've got two walls, one of stone, one of turf, blocking off people coming from the north of Scotland, essentially the Picts. So we had Britons who were the original inhabitants of the British Isles, who lived under the Roman Empire for 400 years or so, and who spoke a form of primitive Welsh that was evolving into Old Welsh. And there were four big kingdoms and a lot of small kingdoms, but the big kingdoms that some of your listeners may have heard about or may be familiar with was 
the kingdom of Reged, which was based around modern Carlisle on the Solway Firth into Dumfries and Galloway. We had Strathclyde, which was based, its hillfort capital was Dum, the really magnificent Dumbarton Rock, which is in the Clyde, just to the west of Glasgow. Then moving back along the wall to the east, we had the Britons of Gadawthen, Manal Gadawthen based on their Hillfort hill capital was almost certainly Castle Rock in Edinburgh. And we had obviously the um, kingdoms in what is now Wales. So Gwyneth being at that time, Gwynedd being the, the major, the powerhouse Welsh kingdom at that time. And all of these people spoke Welsh and they were the original inhabitants of the British Isles who had been supplanted. But when the Rome, Romans came in, you know, 400 years earlier, over in Ireland, you have the Irish, who the Romans called the Hiberni. So the, the Irish were in Ireland. They were speaking a um, primitive Irish that was evolving into Old Irish at this time. They were never conquered by Rome. And you had the Picts in Scotland, as, as I mentioned. They were a, also another sort of indigenous people who were um, living in Scotland when the Romans came, never conquered by the Romans and constantly harassing them. Um, their name Picti in Latin means the painted ones, probably referring to their custom of tattooing themselves entirely with woad, which produced a lovely blue color. So I'm and, thinking William Wallace style. Yes, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, okay. yeah. And then the 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 area that I concentrate on the the Scots of the Kingdom of Dalriada, or it, it anglicized today to Dalriada, which was a kingdom based in the southwest of Scotland and the Inner Hebrides and was a maritime kingdom that had territory on both sides of the North Channel and the Irish Sea. So half of Dalriada was in Scotland. Based, its hillfort capital was Dunad or Dunath. Dunad Hillfort, which is you can still visit today, which is in the southern part of Kilmartin Glen which is just north of the town of Loch Gilpid and below Oban. And that was their main hill fort capital. But they had the other half of their kingdom was in the glens of Antrim in Ulster in Northern Ireland. So Romans leave and Saxons are coming in and every all of these peoples are on the move and they're all fighting each other for supremacy in the British Isles. And this went on, you know, until... Well, as I said, for for really hundreds of years. And so the Dark Ages for historians, for early medieval historians in particular, specifically means from about 410 as a benchmark to the arrival of the Vikings in the very late 8th century. So they first showed up and they sacked Lindisfarne in 793 and then they sacked Iona in 795. So the way I was uh, taught is that the early, the Middle Ages can be divided into three sort of easy periods, roughly spanning 400 years each. Early medieval, 800, um, 400 to 800, so fall of Rome to Vikings. Central Middle Ages from 800 to about 1200, so Vikings to the roughly the Normans. And then the later Middle Ages or high Middle Ages from 1200 to about 1600. So it's easy if you think about it in chunks of, you know, 400 years. Essentially, this is the era of oh, all of these characters, these mythic figures and heroes that listeners certainly would have heard of King Arthur and Merlin and St. Patrick and all of those figures uh, in this period, which is really paused, poised between myth and history, because history, the history of the period didn't start to be written until the era that I write about specifically by St. Columba of Iona, who was one of the main characters in my book. So before that, it's, it's dark in that it's obscure. We don't really know what was going on, but we can piece together. Archaeology is an enormous help, very exciting time to be, be an archaeologist, especially in Scotland. They're doing fantastic work unearthing the physical remains of a really um, advanced and very populous civilization that for us has been lost because we just didn't they they didn't leave records about themselves and um nobody's bothered to dig them up until now 
It's so so strange uh, listening to this. It's it's so similar to the ancient Greek Dark Ages, which again, uh, um, yeah, have 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 that kind of mythical. Uh, where myth meets history. So yeah. now I'm assuming that the tribes and that you've just been talking about yeah. are, and I'm sure you can correct me, but they they are complete savages, and and the Romans um, were far more uh, civilized. And so uh, once the Romans left, it turned into some massive bloodbath, and everyone and no one's really producing anything of of note culturally. I'm sure you're looking at me quizzically okay. <laughs> like I'm I'm completely lost my mind. I'm wrong, aren't I? Well, and this this adds to the, you know, the the misnomer of calling it the dark ages. Yeah, it's it's wrong. I mean, all societies at this time were warlike. It's how you consolidated and then maintained power. The Irish, it must be said, who are sort of the foundation of the Scots of Delrieta. Scot Scotty in in Latin means Irish. It means, you know, those those darn Irish raiders. So underpinning at least that part of this area that we're talking about, Ireland and the South, the Dalriatic Kingdom of the Scots in Southwestern Ireland was a really, really advanced set of legal codes that underpinned all of Irish society. And, and things were, you know, very well, um, as far as they were able, they tried through law to keep people as peaceful as possible. But war was the, um, default uh first like maybe last level of diplomacy of the age so things usually ended up in a in a bust up also because the other interesting thing about this period is that this was before currency so wealth was measured on the number of cattle you owned and the basic unit of currency in ireland at this time for instance was one milk cow so a cow that could produce milk, so cheese and that kind of thing, or one ounce of, which was equivalent to one ounce of silver, which was a, it called the unit of measurement or currency was called a set. So that was worth two sets, which was the equivalent in value to a third of a female slave. And that kind of tells you in a very kind of quick little brush stroke, what drove the economy of these cultures was raiding, cattle raiding, slave taking. It was about plunder because those movable resources were what allowed you as, as a lord to, I was going to say lord it over everybody else, but you know, keep everybody underneath you in line. Irish society was based on a system of clientship where you had four grades or class of uh, men and women kings at the very top and then you had a bunch of grades of nobles and then you had a bunch of grade of commoners who were broken up broken down into two main groups those who were free and those who were unfree in various ways and then you had slaves at the very bottom so kings held on to power by exchanging resources like cattle or land in return for the manual labor of their their clients or their or the the men underneath them and that's basically what held society together you know such as it such as it could be at the time but you got to basically think people were cattle raiding all the time and it, it was it was a very fraught time to be alive and, and slavery then you know clearly there's a market there is slavery's commonplace absolutely absolutely yes and um I was recently rereading as uh, uh, St. Patrick, who was an apostle to Ireland, left us a couple of letters. And one of them is letter to Caroticus, a, a warlord by the name of Caroticus, who we believe was living in Strathclyde. So Dumbarton Rock, Glasgow area at the time. Patrick castigated Caroticus for taking coming over to Ireland and taking people to enslave them. Right, which is horrible enough. Caroticus would just come, he'd send over his men, they'd, you know, they'd raid, they'd pick up people from the foreshore, blow them in the boats, and that was the end of it, you know. But um, in reading the letter for the, I don't know why this never struck me before, but there, it seems to be that Patrick was horrified by the concept of slavery to begin with, but mostly he was upset that Caroticus was enslaving freeborn men. The, the people who were free and who should have been, you know, free of these kinds of worries were being taken. And oh, my goodness. And then secondly, that he was taking Christians and that these Christians were being forced into slavery amongst the Picts who were heathen at the time. They hadn't been, you know, converted over to Christianity yet. So um, 
you know, you, you know, it's endemic when you can be upset about, you know, the fact that they weren't enslaving the, the right kind of people. Fair game to, to take anybody else. Yeah. But I guess that letter is interesting as well to someone like me, who's, who's not so familiar. with. But there's obviously uh, plenty of interaction going on between all these groups, trade, presumably with tribes yeah. That, yeah. Are, that are on yeah. the yeah. continent as well. Yes, absolutely. Because what we have to remember, it's hard for us when we look at maps today, we tend to look at land masses and we say, oh, you know, this is, you know, there was a sea between, you know, Ireland and Britain and between Britain and the continent. But in fact, those seas were highways and there was very fertile, significant cross fertilization of culture and technology and ideology and peoples. People were in, the, in and out of their boats all the time because, in fact, it was easier to sail than it was to get anywhere overland because Britain and Ireland at this time were still very heavily forested. So we have to think of the ocean as a highway. Yes, yeah, so I'd read about the rivers and streams of Cornwall and Devon and how from both sides, uh, I guess from the Irish Sea and from the mm -hmm. English Channel, mm -hmm. traders would travel up the river and then carry the boat over and get to the north side that way Portage, um, and especially in scotland there's a very common place name in scotland is tarbert and it means a boat drag so it's where you'd take your boat up as far up the river as you could then get out put it on your shoulders and carry it to the next river and, and you know plop it back in and get back on and be on your way so um where there was water the traveling was easy well, you've mentioned one figure, and I guess this will be a helpful uh, segue into another. But but St. Patrick, who's this, you know, huge, well, certainly on the British Isles, probably more famous even than uh, for English people, I doubt. Well, maybe St. George, but I, I would have thought even St. Patrick is a bigger name than, than St. George. Mm -hmm. And so he is right around the time of the, the, the retreat of the Romans, isn't he? Yeah. But we're not entirely sure when he was yeah. around, do we? Exactly. I, I think it's it's safest to say that he lived and worked wholly within the fifth century. The annals, the Irish annals, which is the basis for our, our any sort of understanding we have about the history of this really early period, give his death date three different times. So in the 420s or the 460s or the 490s, and it's most likely um, historians have decided that he probably died in about 461. And he was in that very first wave of attempts to bring Christianity um, in, you know, from the death throes of the Roman Empire, which by this point had taken on Christianity as the official state religion to evangelize. He wanted to bring Christianity to the people who had formerly enslaved him in what's now modern county down in um, in the north of Ireland. We'll get to Columba because he's obviously a big figure. But yeah. St. Augustine at the time, St. Augustine was did the equivalent job on Britain itself, didn't he? He did, yeah. So he was sent by Pope Gregory the Great in the very late 597 to bring Christianity to the Saxons, specifically in Kent. To backtrack a little bit, Columba, who I guess we'll, we'll talk about more fully in a second, had brought Christianity from Ireland into Scotland, but the Saxon kingdoms who were setting up shop in the south and the east, and even in this time, at the, by this point, along the northeast coast of Britain, up in what became known as Northumbria, they were not yet Christian. So Pope Gregory is like, right, we need to send a mission. This is a mission field. We need to send them. Um, I think Augustine was requested. I think the wife of, I forget the name of the king, but the wife requested, she was Frankish. They worshipped Christ and she wanted, having been sold into slavery to this Kentish Saxon king, she wanted the freedom to be able to worship as she used to in her own court. So she requested a priest to be sent and that was St. Augustine. Right. And then the, the, the Roman sort of Roman form of Christianity moving up from the south. And the, again, another sort of misnomer was not quite right. The Celtic form or the Irish form of Christianity coming in from the West and the North. And they they met at the Synod of Whitby in 663 to the detriment of the form of Christianity that was followed by the monks who had been trained in Ireland. I see. And, and from Iona. Yeah. 
Right. Well, then St. Patrick is the foremost saint of Ireland, but Columba is another saint of yeah. Ireland, isn't he? Yeah. And he he's yeah. the he's a very important figure, particularly in in your uh, your area of expertise. Hugely, isn't hugely it? important, and and um, one might argue, um, I might upset some of your listeners, but perhaps more important. We certainly know a lot more about him. He is the first person to really emerge from the sources that we, the very scant sources we have for that period, as a fully fleshed out human being. So the primary sources we have for him, uh, I'll backtrack a little bit. So St. Columba was born in about 521 in traditionally the town of Garton, which is in County Donegal. And he was born into the very upper echelons of his society. He was a prince. And his cousin's father was actually the overlord of one of the main major provinces at the time in Ireland. There were five. His cousin happened to be overlord of the province of Ulster. And his name was Anmara McSetna. And he was from the, a, a family called the Enail, which is how you would pronounce it in Old Irish, but it became the O'Neills, which is people are probably much more familiar with. So Columbo was born into a princely family at the very esh- top echelon of his society. And he was what was called, the Irish term for it was called re-dovna. Re means king and dovna means worthy. So in other words, king worthy. Essentially within Irish law, any freeborn man within four generations of a previous king could put himself up for election when a king died. So it was a kind of democratic process in that what would happen is you'd have this re all these young men who were like, okay, I'm going to be a fantastic next king. Choose me, choose me, choose me. Lots of politicking. And then all of the freeborn men or free men in the society would vote. And that's how they chose their king. So Columba could have been king. He could have been chosen king if he wanted to. But instead, the, the sources that we have tell us, suggest that he was just called to, for, to a different path. He was much more interested in Christianity, got a call from God as a very young man, and he decided to go into the church. He, As a young, very young man at the age of seven, he asked his parents, rather than fostering me out, which is a whole nother aspect of early medieval society in this period, rather than fostering me out to some king with whom you wish to cement an alliance, can you please foster me to a, out to a priest? Because I, I want to learn about this new form of spirituality and this new god because at this time ireland was still very much pagan it's really a fascinating period because everything was up for grabs and nothing had yet been solidified into along the lines that are familiar to us now so and and, and what's this fostering then yeah so so this is this is both fascinating and horrifying to modern audiences but what they would do is every young boy and girl when they reached the age of seven they'd be sent out to be fostered by somebody else, some other family. And the girls were fostered from the age of seven to 14. And they were taught, you know, the the domestic arts, how to milk a cow, how to work the loom, all these other things. And the boys were fostered from the age of seven to 17. And they were taught the arts of war. And you did it. It was, it was one of the ways, it's hearkening back to your early comment, Um, or point about perhaps this period being a lot more bloodthirsty than under the Romans. This was actually one of the ways, aside from a very, very robust legal system, one of the ways that everybody kept the peace, because you send your kid out, you send your child, your beloved child out to be raised in their most formative years by somebody else, usually at least your social equal or your social superior. And then you take other people's into your house to foster them. And those ties of of loyalty and alliances knit society together across kin groups, across kingdoms sometimes, so that later when these children grow up, they'd be far less likely to go attack their foster brother or foster sister because for them, those relationships were more precious to them than their own siblings and parents because they had been without their parents in their most formative years. So it was a very clever and kind of heartless way, if you think about it from our modern perspective, to try to create stability across, uh, you know, across kin groups and across uh, what otherwise might be competing, you know, kingdoms. And 
So Columba decided, I don't want to be taught the, the arts of war. I want to learn. I want to be a priest. Yeah, so he's a bit he's a bit more bookish. He's in, than than oh, uh, absolutely, and especially yeah. He was um had a phenomenal career and was a, a very learned man. He the other thing that was going on in Ireland at the time um, was that it was in its first flush of monasticism, and these were men who had either been taught by Patrick and his compatriots or by the men whom Patrick had taught. And monasticism was a movement that came out of the Middle East. It was a way uh, after the first flush of Christianity had worked its way through the Roman Empire, that people were kind of worried that um, it'd become a, 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 an aspect of state bureaucracy. So Christianity, especially when St. Paul got involved, he tied it to the political hierarchy and made it a state religion. And Christians were like, hang on a second, this is getting very far removed from the Christianity we have been thought, which was taught, which was much more simple and concerned about care in the community, especially those who are outside the social elite. So women, children, the infirm, the the sick, prostitutes, slaves. Christianity was, you know, as Christ bequeathed it, was a, a religion for the oppressed classes, not the ruling classes. So monasticism was a way in the early church to try to get back to the original kind of more pure roots. And Ireland had a first flush of monastic fervor in the early 500s and set up these huge monastic schools in Ireland. Um, a very famous one where Columbus studied was a school set up in Clonard and set up by Finian of Clonard. And at its height, it had 3,000 students. Can you imagine? Yeah, that's. Students. I know. It's, they, so it sounds very much like Ireland is at the forefront of, of, of the British Isles. Yes, of, at that time, time learning, right? at that time, they, they took hold of all of the things that the apparatus of Christianity offered them the concept of writing things down. I mean, my goodness, what a wonder that was to early people who didn't have a written language yet. You know, it had a very, very rich and very deep and very long oral history of sagas and legends and myths and law. And now suddenly they could prescribe it for the ages. You know, they really took to it. It really suited them. It suited their love of, of language and literature and learning. So they set up these huge monastic schools. And Columba benefited from that as a young man. We know that the, the equivalent would be he had like two PhDs. So he, he went for, to school to learn divine wisdom. And then he learned law. And then he learned the scriptures. And he just, he was one of these people who was just driven to consume as much knowledge as was available to him at the time. And then did extraordinary things with that because he also comes across, and I think it's clear from his legacy, both then and and now he was driven by a desire to do good in the world which can't be said even of other you know many other abbots and priests of his age so the other thing that was going on at this time and this is why this the, the, the i've been having such a good time writing these stories because suddenly it's so timely because the 6th century and specifically the year 536 when columba would have been a young man of 15 has been described recently by epidemiologists and historians as the worst year to ever have been alive. Wow. Yeah, I know. And you're like, that, that can't be true. That can't be true. They're like, look, sixth century as a whole was the worst century to be alive. But specifically, if you were alive in the year 536, so when Columbo was going to school, 15 years old, it was the worst year to be alive because there was, a, they didn't understand what was going on at the time. But in 536, and a volcano in Iceland blew up and it covered in the Northern Hemisphere in darkness for 18 months. So, so of course, they're all going to assume this is God showing disfavor. Yeah. yeah. And so, how, in, how influential was that on the growth of Christianity? Hugely influential because they didn't have the, you know, it, it, and then let me just say it gets far worse. There's so much. This was just the beginning of it. And so let me let me finish. Let me finish sort of throw some dates and facts sure. at you and we can talk about that because that is really what was the driving catalyst for change at this time was people's simple desire to figure out what was going on and how they were possibly going to survive this and what they needed to do to, you know, have any sort of 
quality of life at all because 536 volcano in Iceland blows then it, the other main character in my books Aiden was born in 538 so he was two years old then in 540 540 so you've got crop failures you've got famine you've got drought because there's no sunshine and they don't know why so everything is failing economics you know de stagnation deprivation 540 in 540 second eruption the same volcano in Iceland 541 suddenly the plague shows up in Egypt bubonic plague shows up in Egypt and that spreads over the early 540s 541 it shows up in Egypt then it's in Istanbul then in 542 it's in Gaul 543 it's in England 544 it's in Ireland so the plague now on top of this decimates it takes 30 to 50 percent of the population can you imagine half the people you know are dead within three to seven days of contracting this. And they had no understanding of what in the world was causing this, except some sort of judgment of their gods, you know, not just Christ, because we were, were also, they were, you know, a good part of the population was still polytheistic rather than monotheistic, but they, they have no way, no basis of understanding what this is about and how to get out of it. And then the plague, we know, stuck around Europe. It would show up, pop up every year somewhere, it, there was another major outbreak in 550 and then another major outbreak in 576. So this is the period in which my characters are living. And they must I, have I, been, I mean, people must have been wandering around. I was speaking to a historian about the Black Death in the Middle Ages. Yeah. But there were uh, pe but people in this period, I guess they had knowledge, but not nothing like as much as they did, uh, uh, you know, a thousand odd years later. Yeah. Just been wandering around traumatized with Absolutely. half the people you know dead. Dead. And just, you know, there were so few people left to bury them. They just, the bodies would be lying on their doorsteps. Animals were left undomesticated. Um, Paul the deacon who wrote a history of the Lombards, it's a very haunting, evocative phrase. He said the world had returned to its ancient silence. Mm. So one thing that was a result of this is that Columbo, who was living through this, he miraculously survived, you know, and he decided there was a second flush of monasticism as a result of this, of trying to really organize themselves in a way to protect the people who had survived and then offer some sort of basic care to people who were left suddenly without their kin, without any means. You know, there was no no hospitals, there's no schooling. You were either you lived and were protected within your kin group. And when they were not there, you were vulnerable and defenseless. So the second wave of monasticism that came about over the course of Columbus lifetime. So you know, beginning in the mid sixth century, it was a it was a reaction to horrible natural catastrophes and calamities that they were living with on a daily basis. So, Columba, we know as you've illustrated, is a uh, is this bookish chap who is a brilliant student, but he doesn't. He's not all hard work and and yeah, no play. Okay. He yeah. because he has to leave Ireland under a yeah. cloud, doesn't he? He does. He does. And this is this. I I find this a joy because he may or may not have founded the monastery of Derry by this time. So traditional accounts, although these were written later and you know added back in um, five forty six. But for some. At this time, as I sort of alluded to earlier, his family, the Northern Enail, the Northern O'Neills, are fighting for supremacy of the northern half of Ireland with another branch of their family, the Southern Enails or Southern O'Neills, who are ruling from Tara. And Columba gets involved in those battles, particularly a battle called Kuldrevni in 561 which was waged below the slopes of Ben Bulbin in modern county Sligo. I should back up and say that the primary source we have for the life of Columba, for what this man actually did with his life, which was extraordinary, it's a book called The Vita Sancti Columba, or The Life of St. Columba, written by Adavnon, who was the ninth abbot of Iona, which was the monastery that Columba eventually founded. And he was a major statesman and ecclesiastic in his own right. So Adafnan, at around probably to celebrate the centenary of Columba's death in 597, decides that he's going to interview everybody who might possibly have known Columba. He's going to consult the libraries. He's going to consult an even earlier book written by the sixth abbot of Iona, a man called Cumina the White, who was writing, had published his book in the 640s. And he's going to write a life about this saint. 
And um, it's not straight up biography because that didn't exist at the time, that genre of writing, but it's a hagiography, which is a piece of work that's designed to promote a saint's cult by showing you, laying out the proof, the evidence for that saint's sanctity. So Adamnan writes this book in the 690s, and in it, he tells us a very curious story. He says, in the year 563, Columba was excommunicated and then exiled from Ireland. So here's a man in his 40s who's at the top of his game in the local sort of, he's a big power player in the local scene in Ireland. He's, you know, he's, a, he's the mentor of kings. He's, you know, and then suddenly he's excommunicated. This is like... Oh, he's excommunicated, excommunicated by the Pope. Excommunicated, not, not by the Pope, but by a council, an ecclesiastical council of all the ecclesiastics, the abbots and the bishops and the priests in Ireland. They come together and they decide that he has done something heinous enough that they have to kick him out of the country. And then he said, don't know what it is. And Adamnan does not say it. He doesn't say what he does do is he links causally as somewhat cause of infect he, he dates columbus exile in 563 to two years after this battle that is columbus family waged to gain control of the northern half of north half northern half of ireland so historians have been led to believe from adamnon's words that there's some cause and effect here he did something in that battle and he got exiled centuries of literature and myth and stories had been had accrued about St. Columba because he was such he was so beloved he still is beloved in Donegal so he went around to all the libraries he collected all the manuscripts he could find and he wrote another life in old Irish and that's called the old Irish life or the Betha Colm Killa life of Columba and it's in that one that they explicitly say that Columba was exiled from his for his part in this battle waged by his relatives for the control of the northern half of Ireland so as far as we know, well, we don't know much, and this is where the fiction comes in, which makes it exciting, but um, he's kicked out of Ireland and he's exiled. And at this time, um, that was literally a death sentence because you had legal rights as long as you stayed within the boundaries of your own kingdom. Once you set foot outside of them, you were free, free game. Anybody could just kill you. They could maim you they could enslave you and there's nothing you could do about it. So what Columba, what we know that he did was he hightailed it for some reason, he hightailed it to Dunad, which was the Hillfort capital of the Scots of Dovereda. So you basically, you go up the Sound of Jura and you're straight into Loch Crinan and you're right there. You can do it. You can sail in the ocean going currics of the time, which were seven oars, 14 oarsmen, and a helmsman. If you had the, the right tides, and the tides there are some of the strongest in the world, so they'd time it. The tide turns four times a day, every six hours. So you'd, you'd sail as far as you could, then you'd, you'd find some island and haul up and wait for the tide to turn again. And then they get on that sleigh ride and get, and the tides flow naturally from the north of Ireland to that area of Scotland. So he booked it up there and he put himself as far as, Adamnon then does actually tell us he put himself under the care of the king of the Scots of Dalriada because by that time Columba and the men who went with him into exile would have been they were considered kinless so they had no legal rights and a king in Irish law is responsible for the kinless man so you basically say look I'm here um, can you take me under your protection and I'll be your man and so that's what he did. That was in 563. And from there, he, you know, from from having everything, he's got nothing. There's some dark secrecy, dark shroud over his reputation. He's done something heinous enough to get excommunicated, you know, and then just chucked out of Ireland. And um, he begs for land to form a new monastery. And some sources say it was the King Connell, the King of the Scots of Darida, who gave him Iona which goes on to become the the powerhouse political and religious center in the whole region for centuries and the greatest monastic establishment of its age. And um, from Iona and the community that grows up there, missionaries are sent out that bring learning and culture and Christianity into Scotland, to Lindisfarne, various points along the east coast of Britain. And then 
and then into Europe. So they, the Irish through this nodal point of Iona and other monasteries that Columbus friends were setting up in Ireland, send men out with books to pagan lands and um, bring Christianity to the West. Extraordinary, really. So listeners are very fortunate to hear about this story of really how Ireland and Scotland become so influential in this period. Yeah, this was this was Columba started what was we now call Scotland and Ireland's golden age. This was the golden age of learning. I mean, it was an explosion of writing new forms of new genres were being created. Columbus credited with creating the um, what we know about early Irish history and Scottish history is based on a series of annals, which were um, a chronicles that were kept in monasteries as a way to keep track of major events that had occurred at monasteries. And, you know, the famous ones in Ireland are the annals of Ulster and the annals of Tigernach. There's the annals of Inishfallen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But historians realized quite a while ago that the core, the core of those annals upon which all of our understanding of this early period is based was a, a, a now lost chronicle written on Iona, possibly begun by Columba himself, if not, if not that immediately after his death, because the first entries are from about the year, you know, 600. And that forms the, the core, the basis, the, this so-called lost Iona chronicle for all of our, the, the, they would be taken to other monasteries and they would use that as sort of the starting point to start keeping their own annals about what was going on in their particular regions. So Columba did that. You know, he decided, well, I, I'd like to keep track of events and perhaps sort of keep track of time. And, you know, we are here in this age and th there should be some memory, institutional memory of what happened to us. I, it just thrills me. Yeah, early early history, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, yeah, this is yeah, this has been um, God such a lesson. I also like the fact that with your description of their fostering, that seems sounds like an early form of public school as well. Yeah. So. Yes, yeah, that's a really good analogy. I think that that's right. Yeah. So yeah. Um, except that I don't know if many public schools, or boarding school, I should really boarding say. school would be so enamored. I mean, they loved their foster parents as if they had their terms of endearment for their foster parents were more affectionate than for their own parents. They loved that they were their. You know, I can't say that not having. That's been not my experience school. of boarding yeah, exactly. school. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Paula, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, for talking through this really. Well, it's a fascinating period and, and it just makes me want to read more about it, actually. That's perfect, because well, I've, I've got some books for you. Well, indeed. Well, I've, for, uh, for listeners, I've, I've put links in the show notes for, for you to follow up on with Paula's. It's actually four books you've written in total, isn't yep. it? Yep. And I'm working on book five and there will be at least eight. They're all fully plotted. I'm just um, working my way through them. The, the next one, I've recently come back from a research trip to the Orkneys and to the Inner Hebrides, Tyree in particular, because um, basically the, the story starts out in this, we haven't even talked about Aidan McGabrin, who's the- No, I know, we ran I out, know. I we, know, we, we'll have we, to get you back to talk yeah. about that. Yeah, because it's a dual, so the books are a dual biography of the two men who founded the Monastery of Iona and the, the nation kingdom of Scotland, a warlord and a saint. So like King Arthur and Merlin, but true, historically accurate as, authentic as I can possibly make it but uh yeah lots more to come and um it's been it's been my greatest joy to sort of just delve around in this murky period and try to bring to life what life might have felt like to the people who were living there at the time wonderful stuff Paula thank you so much pleasure thanks for having me on Thank you very much for listening. Links are in the show notes. Plenty more great history to come, including The Film Club on Tuesday with Gallipoli, the 1981 Aussie film starring Mel Gibson and Mark Lee. Until then, thank you and good night. <laughs> <laughs>